I'd like for you to take your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 13. And um, I've, I've never shied away from mentioning names uh, when I feel like it's appropriate. Some things are private, and uh, sometimes people tell me things, or sometimes I learn things about people that are private, and they, um, it would be wrong for me to just go smear their name all over the place, and so I stay away from that. When, when it comes time, however, that I have to deal with a certain subject because of what people have turned themselves over to or what they have been turned over to, um, then it goes along. The Apostle Paul did this. You have to name names. And because of the public way that uh, at least one of these young men uh, have portrayed themselves and have revealed to the world what it is that they stand for and what they believe in, um, then I have, to, I, have to, um, I have to be public about my warning to anyone who might be uh, affiliated with this person or uh, maybe, um, maybe you might think that they are doing a real good work and that you trust them and if they say something and you just have so much trust in them that you feel like you have to agree with them. Um, can Jaden, can you go get on my desk and get my phone, if you would, please? I'm going to make a phone call. No, I'm just kidding. I, I feel like I need to read uh, a little bit of what was shared. Now, again, all of this is public. This is not a private issue, not something shared with me in private. This was a post that uh, he made, and... Um, and I am going to address it. Um, my wife is the one who actually brought it to my attention. And um, let me see if I can find the beginning of it. If you remember, uh, years ago, we had a couple of young men, Brady and Bradley Crumb, twin brothers, when... Uh, they contacted me, they were 16 years old, and um, one of them was a Jehovah's Witness, and the other one was a Mormon at that time. And that seemed kind of odd to me that those twin brothers would be different like that, um, but the bottom line is it was for the most part, it was because their parents weren't anything. Their mom and dad did not lead them as far as spiritual things are concerned, did not teach them truth. And so they've always had an interest in studying things, reading things, and so on. And so Brady uh, was a Jehovah's Witness, and Bradley was a Mormon. And uh, one day I, I met them over at their house, and I gave them some of uh, the videos that I had made uh, at that time and gave it to them and talked to them a little bit. And they were just delighted to see me. And, and uh, I just let the word speak to them. Well, lo and behold, uh, first it was Bradley. He came here and uh, we prayed there in my office and uh, he said he had asked Jesus into his heart. I baptized him here, and uh, I would let him preach. His brother Brady was a Jehovah's Witness. He was a little bit uh, harder to reach at the time, and so uh, he was um, trying to tell his brother that I was a wolf and and so on, but eventually Brady came around, 
and I baptized Brady. And so on Sunday nights, I would let them preach. One Sunday night, Brady would preach. The other Sunday night, Bradley would preach. And my hope was that, that eventually they would get the experience they needed. And, you know, when the time was right, they got old enough, maybe they could uh, pastor a church. But what really happened was, behind the scenes, they were both very vocal with at least one person who used to go to this church about how wrong they thought that I was. And so uh, one of them decided that they were, they were studying the doctrines of a man by the name of Finnis Dake. Well, Dake believed in what's called repeated regeneration. You get saved, but if you sin, you've, you're lost, and you have to repent to get your salvation back, and then you've got it. But then if you sin again, you have to repent to get your salvation back. And one night while I was homesick, he preached that here, behind my back. I gave him space to repent. Uh, at that time, his dad had just found out he had cancer, and his dad got saved. And he wasn't wanting to um, have this known to his father, and I didn't really want to either. So I let him preach a, a little while, but I told him, I said, you can't preach on that issue anymore. I won't have it. Well, sure enough, one night I'm gone, and that's exactly what he does. And so I had to put him out of the pulpit. And there were some people in the church at the time that became very critical of me because I did that. They didn't know what all had happened. And so I went to Brady and I said, Brady, don't ever do that to me. And he said, I won't. I'm with you 100%. I said, good. Well, about six months later, I went to Kenya. This is 2014. And the first thing out of Brady's mouth is Finnis Dake's doctrine. He said that heaven is a planet like earth is, and everybody sitting here are going, what in the world? They're all looking on their phones find out, trying to find out where this comes from. And it caused a lot of controversy while I was gone in Kenya. And so I put him out. Both of those boys went to try out at churches that I know. I know the people and I know the pastor. Those churches never called me to ask me why they were not at our church any longer and what I knew about them. They never called me. So I just let it go. Well, um, when Brady was at a particular church, he was assistant pastor and it was the idea that when the pastor resigned and retired, that Brady would just take his position. But then all of a sudden, Brady quit. He resigned and said, I'm done here. And he went down south to start a Sabbath-keeping church, Hebrew Roots. And it's the teaching that you have to keep all the Jewish laws in order to be saved. And I didn't say nothing. I didn't, you know, didn't, didn't contact him or anything like that. Bradley, in the meantime, went from uh, one church to another church and then out to Oklahoma. And I listened to it. I was there in May. He was at the camp meeting that Brother Reg had, preached one of the best messages I've ever heard. But now, he, I found out that he quit that church. And I didn't understand why. So he posted this. Uh, apparently it was Reformation Day. And what that means is the, the time when basically all of the churches started coming away from the Catholic Church, the Protestant Reformation. He said, um, but, uh, he said, the two big reasons why I'm no longer a Protestant are sola scriptura and sola fide. Now, sola scriptura is Latin for 
only the scriptures. We get our doctrine only from the scriptures. He now has a problem with that. That that's not how God intended it. And then sola fide, does anybody know what that means? Only faith, which means that we are saved only by faith through God's grace. Say amen. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. So he now does not believe in either one of those. And he says, I know this post may come as a shock to many. Um, and he says, by the way, I'm not a Catholic, but Joshua Charles and others pose very strong and good arguments. In other words, he's reading from Catholic theology books. Books that are against the Protestant movement. Books that are against only scriptures. He has uh, had, um, I know, at least three pastors that have contacted him. Bob Tebow's one of them. Um, Mike Hutzel's another. Reg Kelly has contacted him. And Reg's comment to me was that he told him that that is purely satanic what he's believing now. Purely satanic. Now, since I've known both of those young men, they have made, they have transitioned through six major theological standpoints since they were 16 years old. Both of them at one time were Jehovah's Witness, then Mormonism, then here, then Finnis Dake, then Hebrew Roots, and now Catholicism. The Bible talks about those who are double-minded. What does it say about them? They are unstable in all their ways. Now, what I'm going to show you this morning is I'm going to show you why we believe what we believe. Because one of the statements that, that Bradley made was is that you can't read in the Bible anywhere what exactly books are supposed to be in the Bible and that you can't read anywhere in the Bible that there's only supposed to be 66. And he said it in that way, only supposed to be 66. He must believe now, I, I'm assuming he believes in the Apocrypha. And because he's been quoting so many Catholic bishops, then I'm assuming he's reading Catholic literature and following their traditions as well. Their dad, who died shortly after he got saved, would be rolling over in his grave. I know their dad. So let me start in Matthew chapter 13. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung... So I want you to think about it now. The, the wheat is the good seed of the Word of God. Let me just see your hands raised to say, we believe only the Word of God. The enemy comes and sows tares among the wheat, and tares, what we call them now, is poison darnel. They are poisonous, but they look like they are uh, good seed. So in verse 20, when the blades was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. Verse 27, so the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst thou not sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He saith unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, 
Lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. Let's pray. Father, I come before you today, and, and Lord, I am preaching in hope that you laying this on my heart this morning was truly of you. I really, really do not want to get out of your will and of your plan. And Father, I recognize, God, that as sorry as I am and as wicked as I am, you had every right to turn me over to a reprobate mind. But you didn't. So, Father, I cannot boast. I cannot brag. Except to boast of Jesus Christ and His shed blood and His mercy. And so, Father, I thank you, God, that you've saved me, you saved these people, the people that I love dearly. And I pray, Heavenly Father, God, for these two young men. I pray, dear God, that at some point, if they have not gone too far, that at some point you would straighten them, you would correct them. You would chasten them the way a father does a son. And Father, that through that, Lord, that they in their personal lives would glorify you. And then because of the change that you made in their life, Father, that they could glorify you among men. Being able to share their testimony about being out in the wilderness. But Father, I'm troubled today because I know what your word says. And I know, Lord, what happens when people reject your word. I pray, dear God, that you would forgive them both, that you would help them, and God, you would turn them to the right before it's too late. Father, help us, dear God, each, each one of us, because of our sins, because of our disobedience to you, God, all of us deserve to be turned over to a reprobate mind. All of us deserve to be turned back, back into our sins, back into our old lifestyle, or even worse, all of us deserve that. So, Father, where you have us now is not by our own goodness or by our own um, steadfastness. It's only by your grace that we stand today. And I pray, Heavenly Father, God, you would enable all of us to stand and having done all to stand when the evil day comes. Bless us in this church. Bless all of those, Lord, who are listening in, watching in. And Father, I, I pray that, Lord, that even Brady and Bradley both would be watching, whether today or whether sometime later. And God, that you would help them. Bring them back to you, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now, I mentioned that Bradley is the one that I read this from, but he mentioned that it was his brother Brady that brought this to his attention. And that's how it's always been with those guys. They're, very, they're identical twins, which means that they really do stick very close together. And when one of them is, is on something, uh, it's not too long before the other one gets in there. And that's just how it is. And so please pray for them. Now... Uh, as we look back at this parable again, um, in verse 28, after the, the tares are sown, he said unto them, An enemy have done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then 
that we go and gather them up. But he said, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Now, I want to say this, and it's going to be ap applicable to the times that we're living in right now, um, the times of what our country is going through right now, and so on with this election. In a month from now, we'll, we'll have a pretty good idea of where our country's headed, hopefully. We worry that the evil side of this nation is going to win this election and it's going to take over. And we would then question, why is God allowing this? Well, why God allows this to me is very obvious, and it's obvious here in this parable. We live in a sinful and a sin-ridden world. We have sinners all around us. Now, a lot of them sit in churches. And we wouldn't know uh, who's really right with God, who isn't right with God. We, we wouldn't know that uh, until God manifests it somehow, some way. I, I mentioned uh, listening to Bradley preach back in May. I, I find it difficult that he has gone so far afield in his doctrine from May until now. And it's possible that he was already on this journey back before I heard him preach. It's very possible. And, um, and so why, why you, could, you could say, well, why didn't God stop him then? Or why didn't God do anything about it then? Or, or whatever. And the whole point of this seed and the, uh, the, excuse me, the weed and the tares is that God is showing us that it has to be manifest who is on the Lord's side and who isn't. There has to be a line drawn, a clear line of distinction drawn so that it's obvious who is on God's side and who isn't on God's side. Okay? Now, I, I, I would say that if, you know, somebody's walking around with uh, orange, pink, green, purple, and black hair, and they're a woman, and they've got another woman hanging on their arm, I think it's pretty clear whose side they're on. I know we're not supposed to judge by looks, but they're not helping themselves any. Amen? But it is by appearance and the fruit that is manifested that we know who's on God's side. So let's keep reading the, the story. Jesus here gives the analogy of what this means. He answered and said unto them in verse 37 of the same chapter, He that sowed the good seed is the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. It is because God's word has been sown into your dirt. Your dirt. God's seed in your dirt. Your dirt is no good unless God's seed is in it. Amen? But when God sowed his good seed into the dirt of your life, God intended to bread to manifest and bring something good out of your life. So the field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. So... He said, as therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity. Now, setting aside my comments about uh, Brady and Bradley, the idea is, is that if you... Say you're a Christian, call yourself a Christian, make everybody believe you're a Christian, but inwardly there is nothing but sin, idolatry, wickedness that governs your heart in a place where nobody can see. At some point, it's going to be known. It happens with everybody. You can hide who you really are for as long as you want, but at some point, your sin will find you out. Just like these trees out here. 
those colors coming out. We can now identify the trees by those colors that are coming out. Or what kind of tree they are, whether they're growing cherries or apples or pears or oranges or celery. <laughs> celery trees. You never heard of them? At some point, at some point it's going to be known. And I'll tell you this, you may not like it when God brings the harvest to your life. You may not like it because you've got people fooled. You've got everybody believing that you're a good person, you're a good Christian. But at some point, it's all going to come out. Amen? Amen? So, then he says this, verse 41, The Son of Man shall send his angels, send forth his angels, they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. He's describing hell. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And I, and I do this whenever I go and I talk about the Bible issue which the biggest thing that I'm do, dealing with today is the Bible issue. So I have two pictures up here. And if I had to, Dave, if I had to call you up here and have you pick which one of these is wheat and which one of these is tares, and your soul was on the line that if you chose the wrong one, you're going to hell, would you be able to do it? No, no. That was the point that Jesus was making here. Is that we all are human, and we all look human, and so we can't always tell by looking at somebody whether or not they are good seed or they are tares. So let me, let me do it like this. They both say Holy Bible. They both are what, uh, and by the way, let me, let me teach you just a little bit about the Catholic idea of the Bible. In Catholic theology, the Bible is part of the Word of God. But it is not all of the Word of God. The sum of the Word of God in Catholic theology is determined by a group in the Catholic system called the Magisterium. The Magisterium consists of high-ranking cardinals and the Pope himself, and they take the scriptures that they choose, they take the Apocrypha, they take all of all of the Pope's edicts since there was a Pope in the world, all of the Pope's personal doctrines, his personal sayings, the Council of Trent, their tradition, all of that together makes what the Catholics refer to as the Word of God. So if a Catholic says, well, I believe the Word of God, they do not believe the same word of God that you and I believe in. That's, that's what Bradley was getting at. He said in one of his comments that it doesn't say anywhere that the scriptures are limited to 66 books only. And when he said that, I knew exactly where he was getting it from and what he was getting at. And I'm here to tell you this morning that when you have rejected the word of God, you're in big trouble. So let me make it easy for you. I mentioned that tares are referred to as poison darnel. They're called that because on those little seed pods, there's a fungus that grows on there, and it only grows on 
darnel or tares. That fungus causes, number one, when you ingest it, it causes uh, you to go into like a drunken state. It's an intoxicant. Then it kills you. It literally is death to eat it. And so, understand this. We're not just talking about um, whether John 3.16 says his only begotten son or his one and only son. We're talking about a whole group of popes and traditions and other books and God only knows what else that the Catholic Church accepts as the Word of God versus what all of our Protestant reformers, what all of the people who believed in Jesus before the Protestant Reformation, where they had to hide and worship God in secret to this very day where we accept that these 66 books are the Word of God. Somebody say amen. This is what we're dealing with. Remember, there's a curse. In Revelation, anybody who adds to these words, God said, I will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And he means it. So, the poison darnel, when they are ripe, they turn colors. They turn black. The wheat, though being green, when it's time for harvest, what color do they turn? Just like the sun. Isn't that neat? Harvest always is the change. Okay? Now, here's what sola scriptura means. I'm going to run through some things very quickly. I know I won't get through this whole message this morning, I'll carry it on through this afternoon. But the phrase sola scripture means the source and limits of our belief. It is what sets us apart from Catholics, Mormons, etc. Those who have doctrines not supported or originated in the scripture. If God said it, the Bible says it. If the Bible speaks on a subject, we are to believe what the Bible says. Any practice, doctrine, belief, way of salvation attributes of God in Christ, etc., must be founded on at least two witnesses, but those two witnesses must always come from the Word of God. Amen? So if I were to ask you, can you prove to me that Jesus was in fact God here on this earth, how would you do it? Go back in a time machine and The Bible, John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. That right there says he's God. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. That's Jesus saying that he is God. God. He said, I and the Father are one. The glory which thou gavest me I have given them that they may be one even as we are one. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Now see what I've done is I've taken you through verses in the scripture that establish that Jesus is in fact God. I didn't quote uh, Erasmus. I didn't quote um, Alexander the Great, I didn't quote uh, St. Augustine, I didn't quote uh, John Paul II, I didn't quote any of those people. I quoted Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, I quoted them. So what we believe about Christ is limited to what the Bible says about Christ. The blood atonement. The, by, the, what we believe about the blood comes from the Bible, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. 
to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins. Much more being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. See, I'm telling you the blood atonement doctrine comes to us by way of the scriptures. How about salvation by grace through faith? Which is one of the doctrines now cast aside by this young man. He no longer believes that salvation only comes through faith. Which the only thing then that can fill in the gap is that he must believe that salvation comes by works. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So how can you believe that we are saved also by works when the scripture so plainly tells you that it can't be that way? You have to reject the word of the Lord. So the question is, can I believe that my Bible is 100% correct in every subject and in every word. Is it a biblical idea or just the emotional connection to a book that many say has errors? Turn your Bible to 2 Timothy 3.16. I'm going to scoot around a little bit in my notes, and I will save some of this for this afternoon, because if I get wound up in this, I might keep you till this afternoon, and I don't want to do that. Look at 2 Timothy 3, and look at Oh, my. Look at verse 13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. I've mentioned to you that your average Catholic priest, they are some of the most intelligent people in the world because you can't just show up one day saying, I want to be a priest, and they give you a collar and turn you loose. You have to go to seminary and their schools for anywhere from six to eight years, you're being trained and taught. Many, many Catholic priests are doctors, PhDs, chemists, scientists, uh, astronomers, and so on and so on. But for some reason, their heart and their mind is deceived. And they believe that if they bow in front of of a statue, that that statue will hear their prayer. Now that's not ignorance. That's just plain old deception. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Paul said in verse 14, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And notice what he says. Young people, I want you to listen to this. That from a child thou hast known 
the Holy Scriptures. One of the men that passed away this week, Brother Robert Sherry, was the second pastor that I ever knew in my life. And often uh, we would stay with him and his wife and his daughter. He preached here. I learned uh, things from him that a young man should learn from a pastor. I learned Bible verses. I learned that the scriptures are the most important thing to any church. Those are the things that I learned from that man. From a child, I was taught that the Bible is right and it's holy and it is God's word. That from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. He mentions the holy scriptures and he mentions being made wise unto salvation, and he mentions that it comes through faith. Believe what God said. Then he said in verse 16, in fact, read this out loud with me, verse 16 and 17 together. Read it out loud with me. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Is that what you believe? Say amen. Those are the things that they have abandoned. Now, I'm going to skip through this. And now take your Bible, turn to the book of Mark. I mentioned a while ago, Revelation chapter 22, and a warning. And that warning is to anyone who wishes to add to the books of the Bible or any of the words of the Bible, God will add to unto them the plagues that are written in. And you know what, you know what uh, one pastor told Bradley? Bradley, when you are judged by God, you're going to be judged by the Bible. Isn't that what it says? Jesus said, I've come, not to, I've come to judge no man. The words that I speak, they will judge him. You're not going to be judged by what I think or what I say or what I believe. Nobody is. But you are going to be judged. And the thing you're going to be judged by is the Bible. And if your life is not aligned with the Word of God, I would get there. I would ask God, and this goes to everybody, ask God, God, line my life up with your Word so that when you put, God said I put a plumb line in the midst of my people so that when God sets that plumb line next to you, you stand just as straight as that plumb bob is. So in Mark chapter 3, we have what is referred to as the unpardonable sin. I'm going to give you my theory on that. He says in verse 28, Mark chapter 3, Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men. Now let's stop right here. Say amen to that. Think of the worst thing that you've done. And then say amen. Amen, Jacoby. God forgives them all. Blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. Those are forgiven too. I've been mad at God before. 
angry. God forgave that. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Now, a lot of people have opinions on that. Charismatics say that if you don't speak in tongues and the Holy Ghost is trying to make you speak in tongues, then you're blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Eh, that's an easy one. But let me tell you what I think it is. We have an example of it. 1 Samuel chapter 15, turn there. First Samuel 15. I want you to look at verse 3 of First Samuel 15. Samuel is the prophet, and I want you to think of Samuel as your Bible. Because that's, that's what he was. He was the word of the Lord. He spoke by the word of the Lord. So Samuel is your Bible. Saul is the person that is supposed to obey the Bible. And in verse 3, Samuel tells Saul, Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not. But slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. So, Samuel, the Bible, told Saul, I want you to kill Amalek, I want you to kill all of their cattle, everything they have. I want you to destroy all of it. So, what did Saul do? Well, uh, the Bible says in verse 7, Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah until thou comest to Shur that is over against Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, uh-oh, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen, and of the fatlings, and of the lambs, and all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them, but everything that was vile and, ref and refuse, that they destroyed utterly. Is that what God told him to do? To save the best of it? No, he told him to kill everything, including the king. So, verse 10, Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, it repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. So if we look in verse 13, Samuel came to, or Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou the Lord. He's acting spiritual, isn't he? Oh, preacher, that's good preaching. But then he says... Um, uh, blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Samuel said, What meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears, and the lowing of the oxen which, which I hear? In other words, Samuel said, Okay, if you did what you were told to do, how come I hear... <laughs> Why am I hearing that? Now remember, Saul just lied about God's word, didn't he? I've done everything God told me to do. In verse, uh, let's, let's go to verse 22. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. 
Verse 23, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. What religion did Saul end up practicing? Witchcraft. By going to the woman that had a familiar spirit. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Now notice this. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Did you know? Uh, look at verse 25 now. This is Saul. I pray thee, pardon my sin and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. It's twice now he said that. And Saul tried to repent, and God would not hear his confession. And the Bible later on says that God took his spirit from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord came to him. It looks to me like Saul blasphemed the Holy Ghost when he rejected the word of the Lord. Now folks, I, I'm part of this message, I know it sounds like I'm beating up on these on this guy and, and his brother. I'm not trying to do that. I'm warning you to stay away from them. They're dangerous. And I've not said anything in this message that I would not say to them face to face. There's been times when I've sat down with both of them and tried to reason with them. One night, they, uh, Bradley came to my house and we spent probably two hours me trying to share with him the word of the Lord on how he's wrong and he just wouldn't hear it. But th the biggest thing I want you to understand today, you cannot reject the word of the Lord. Don't try to justify your sins. Don't follow after the doctrines of men or the doctrines of devils. Watch out for seducing spirits. They're all out there waiting for you and your children. I love, I love these kids. Most of them are mine. Some of them are yours. I love them all the same. I sat where these kids are sitting right now. I listened to preachers preach the word of God. And God just put something in me that for the most part, I listened to them with the exception of the day I had the Guinness Book of World Records. And any day I sat next to David Stevens. But anyway, that, those are days gone by. But I, I listened to my Sunday school teachers. You know, some of my Sunday school teachers are, are gone. I don't mean dead gone. I mean gone. They rejected the word of the Lord. And I'm just, I'm warning you because my heart's heavy on this issue. I do preach a lot on the Bible. It's because that's everything to me. And I want the Bible to be everything to you and to your family. And I know there's only so much we can do. But pray every day for yourself and that wasp. Pray for yourself, pray for your family, your children, your grandchildren. That in spite of the things that beset us so easily, we never reject the word of the Lord. You see, God told David after Saul had died and before Samuel was born, 
that when, um, not Samuel, Solomon, when Solomon was going to come along, God said to David that I'm going to be his father and he's going to be my son. And if he sins against me, I'll chasten him. I'll whip him. I'll chastise him. But by mercy will I not take from him as I took it from Saul. I think Saul clearly committed the unpardonable sin. And I hope for their sakes that those two twin brothers have not crossed that line. 